So I, um, I missed David's introduction. I don't know if he told you the story about getting an education at MIT. How they say, um, one of our former presidents said that it was like drinking water from a fire hose. So um, you guys are experiencing our fire hose this evening. I'm going to move on to diagnostics. I'm going to try and just, in 10 minutes, talk about one project. Um, which is, we think, a novel platform for uh, laser pointer here for disease detection. And I, obviously, tonight I'll be talking about cancer detection, but hopefully, you'll see that it has some potential applications elsewhere. So I don't have to tell you that there's, you know, an emergence of biomarkers in the field and a growing importance of sensitive and specific biomarkers for early detection, as well as. Um, disease monitoring, as well as pharmacodynamic assessment. We don't have enough good, sensitive, and specific biomarkers. So this is a paper that some of you may have seen that Sam Gambier's lab published last year in Science Translational Medicine, which is a beautiful, it was mathematical, so I loved it, mathematical correlated with clinical um, data analysis of what it is that's so hard about making a blood biomarker. And in this paper, what they looked at was, imagine that you have, let's say, a tumor, it has to make some blood biomarker. Cells are limited in how fast they can make these proteins. They have to make these proteins relatively specifically compared to background. These have to then get into the circulation at some efficiency, and then they'll have some half-life once they're in the circulation. Okay, so this is a collection of limitations on measuring um, detecting a tumor from a blood biomarker concentration. So Sam and his group went through this, this, this beautiful analysis and essentially what they then did was compare how long it would take after tumor initiation, given what we know about uh, typical tumor cell progression, this is an example of ovarian cancer, and compared um, how, how long it would take to do blood biomarker detection as compared to other modalities. So here what you're looking at is transvaginal ultrasound limits and the current clinical ELISA sensitivity for CA125. And what you find here uh, down on the x-axis is that it would take typically about 8 to 10 years to detect a, a, a novel tumor, a new tumor. Okay, so then what he does is, okay, that's kind of where we are. That's the clinical ELISA detection. How could we make it better? And so he's gone through, based on the analysis I showed you previously, all the ways that one would imagine that one could improve this. Okay, so what if the biomarker could get 100% into the vasculature? There was no efficiency loss. What if it's not at all shed by healthy cells, so it's completely specific? What if we, what if the tumor cells make more of it? What if our assays are more sensitive and so on and so forth? And you sort of march down this curve um, into, let's say now, a couple of years. So that's sort of the landscape of the field and why it's been so challenging. And what I want to describe to you now is sort of potentially another way to think about it. So if, with this as a backdrop, these are some things that you could think about if you were an engineer for improving early detection using biomarkers. So the first is that you would increase the biomarker production rate. And I showed you that Sam did that theoretically just by saying how, how much protein could you make. I'm going to show you another way. Um, and most groups, most engineering groups in the literature that you see have been focusing on this number four, which is increasing the sensitivity of the detection platform. So you have a certain amount of biomarker. It is as sensitive and spe as, as specific as it is. Let's increase sensitivity. And there are lots of ways to do that. And they are, in fact, making lots of um, beautiful progress. But what we wanted to do instead was to, to think about that number one. How could you make more biomarkers? So you've already heard from Bob and Paula and Daryl about how you can make nanoparticles traffic to tumors. So here what we're doing is taking advantage of that idea, taking nanoparticles, delivering them in a way that they'll home in on tumors, and make a biomarker that you've exogenously administered. Okay. So this is the idea. So you, make a, you take a nanoparticle. In this case, you decorate it with peptides that are sensitive to proteases in the tumor microenvironment. These can be MMPs. These can be atoms, and so on and so forth. So there's, about, there's, there's many, many members of these families. Okay, so they hone in on the tumor microenvironment. They are, they are processed by the collection of proteases in the tumor microenvironment, and they shed synthetic biomarkers. So one MMP at that site 
at a sort of typical catalytic rate can, can shed 600 synthetic biomarkers in an hour. So you get an enormous amplification by giving this exogenous agent. Now, of course, you have the problem that the, the blood biomarkers have, which is actually these still will get diluted in the blood, right? That's kind of a bummer from a sensitivity perspective. And so we thought, let's take advantage of the fact that now they can be designed to be small. So the nanoparticle before was so big that it wouldn't get out through the glomerulus. It was bigger than five nanometers. But now the shed fragments are small enough that they come right out, and they get concentrated by the kidney back in the urine. OK, so now you've gone from five liters back to a few hundred mils. And so you've take, you reverse that dilution effect. So we've got amplification both from the synthetic biomarker and from renal concentration. And together, we argue that these will be ultra-sensitive modes of detection. OK, so you might say, um, well, that's nice, but you still haven't solved the specificity problem, right? Because now if you have one MMP9 sitting anywhere else other than the tumor, you're still going to get a huge background. You're going to amplify the background. So how do we get around that? So here's an idea that I don't have time to go into in 10 minutes, but the idea is to get around it with multiplexing. Okay, so now instead of using one flavor of nanoparticle, I can use many flavor of nanoparticles. And each nanoparticle, let's say there's 10, can be sensitive to a different protease, MMP2, MMP9, and they have to be co-localized in the tumor to get the signal. How do we read out this multiplex signal? We make it so that the shed fragment has a unique mass. Okay, so we collect the urine and we mass spec the urine and then we get a signature. Okay, so now this is amplification plus multiplexing, so we think it's sensitivity and specificity. So um, this is just images, but I promise there is data and I'm happy to show you data later. Um, the idea here in these animals is that the, the bladders are lighting up in the, in the tumor condition, in the fibrosis condition, and in the thrombosis condition. So we've applied this broadly. You can think about peptides that would be sensitive to all different kinds of cleavage events. So far, we've looked at this in colorectal cancer models, but we think that it should be applicable for ovarian cancer um, or other cancers. And then this is just to sort of think about where might this go next. So what I showed you was an injectable nanoparticle, but one can think about an implantable wafer that would do a controlled release. So imagine that there's a patient at risk for recurrence over a week or a month or two months after discharge. You might want to implant a wafer and have these synthetic nanoparticles coming out over time. And then you don't want to mass spec the urine routinely, but maybe you could have a paper diagnostic. So this is like a home pregnancy test kind of thing that would turn a color, imagine. Um, upon recurrence. So that's kind of so two examples of kind of where we're going next. So I thank you for your attention. This is our group. Um, and it's really a pleasure to talk to you all. I have some good friends already here at the Dana-Farber, and I hope to have more. <laughs>